Welcome to the third programme in the series that takes the fear out of buying antiques. My name's Ian McMillan and I've joined forces with antiques expert Maurice Goodlad and we're going to show you how to turn a house into a home. Oh, good morning, Maurice. Come Thanks, John. Nice day. John and Jill have just bought this house in a small village called Thornley Dale in the middle of the North Yorkshire Moors. Their aim is to move in in six months' time, which gives us plenty of opportunity to uncover the types of antiques they're looking for. Last week, we helped John and Jill find items for their rooms downstairs with a look at antique fairs and the work of craftsmen. And this week, we really are going to encourage you to get off your settees and get out there. It's the turn of the upstairs as we go in search of antiques from around the country in a way to prove that antiques buying is for everyone and can be a great deal of fun without having to break the bank. In here, once upon a time, you could see the likes of Cary Grant, Errol Flynn, Alistair Sim and John Wayne. Because this used to be the town cinema and people would queue up excitedly to watch their heroes on the silver screen. Now it draws a different kind of audience. Last week we saw Morris rummaging through some items for a house clearance sale. This week let's see what he's found on our antiques treasure trail. They've come from far and wide and they all have one thing in common getting the hands dirty while looking for a bargain. From breakables to household goods, from a bygone era, there's something for everyone at a house clearance sale. It'll just take a good bit of rummaging around and not being afraid of making a fool of yourself. Morris, is this a, is this a piano stool? Um, well, I wouldn't put my sheet music in there, actually, because it would up. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually an Edwardian code. This is the sort of thing that you would find in an auction like this, a house clearance, where you get items like that that are a little tired, need a good clean-up, polish, revarnish, and, and you know, a nice, affordable antique. And this comes straight from a house, hasn't it? Straight from the house, yeah. Definitely. Okay. Obviously not been through a dealer's hands, hasn't been refurbished right now. And a lot of people are looking for antiques in this sort of state so they can do it themselves. Get on, lot 16, box of plastic where 100 pence is bid for it. One pound, in other words, two pounds. Without question, the sale is an informal social gathering as well. John and Jill brought along the kids to see how mum and dad were spending their money. Although everyone's eye is on looking for a bargain, the type of items found here do take the pressure off when you're bidding for the first time. It's a great place to come and practice. Maybe a good stepping stone before the more serious auction houses. Six pounds worth, Mrs Hodgkins, six pounds, Fred, thank you. It's uh, different to that other auction, isn't it, John? It certainly is. It's much more informal and really light-hearted at times. Uh, it's the sort of place I, I would think you could really pick up a bargain or two. Whereas at, uh, at Driffield, it was very, very much the professional collectors and the, and the enthusiastic collectors. Mm. Here, it's just local folk out for a social gathering. It's, uh, it's really quite interesting. This caught me eye, Morris, while I was looking around. It's a sewing machine. I think sewing machines are such beautiful things, aren't they? We've got one just like this at home. Yeah, they are nice, and, and they're really precision instruments. And I'm amazed that they really haven't gone up in value over the last 20 years or so. The problem is that so many houses had these. Mm. And, of course, if you think about what the 1930s depression, when the, all the, the ladies in the house were... Uh, mending and, and mm. making up things and I have a lot of these brought into the shop and because it's so nice because of all this uh, enamel black enamel with all the gilt on it lovely decorations around here people expect a lot of money for them but they're not and well I offer around about 20 pounds mm. this might go for 20 25 it's got a nice carrying case still very useful still work but they're also and nice to look very, at aren't they? Very, beautiful things to look at well I like them but they're not, uh, they never really appreciate in value because of the quantity that are available. Yeah. And they're also, it's also plonked on these chairs, and these are nice chairs, aren't they, Morris? Yes, they are very nice. The, the problem there is that you've got three. Ah. You know, you need four. And, and actually, if you look at price, four would be worth twice uh, the three. Is it often the case, then, that you get three at this kind of place? Uh, in this sort of place, you'd be lucky to find a set of four. Uh, nice Victorian dining chairs. Three, they'll say, put it in the household sale 
four off to the antique sale. <laughs> pound bid, one pound, two pound, three pound. At the auction in Driffield earlier in the series, we saw that every item was in a catalogue. Things are not quite the same here. That's right, bless you, thank you so much. You're checking your catalogue, Morris. This is my own catalogue. They don't actually do catalogues here because they get so many odd little items in boxes and it's coming in from houses, there's so much stuff that it's up to each individual to write his own list. There's nothing printed for them. So you make sure that you get the right uh, lot number when you're looking around. Well, it could be a disaster. I have actually bid for the wrong things. <laughs> I bid for a nice chest of drawers and ended up with a table. <laughs> I think the lot number was 99 and I thought it was 66. <laughs> hey, Morris, it's amazing what you find when you rummage under tables. Look at the yeah, box of frames here. Yeah? yeah, but they're all modern now. You want the interesting ones. No, like this. Who knows what you might find? This is what I like about these auctions. What the you boxes found? under the table. What have you found? Well, I found a, a carpet beater in that. Uh -huh. And they're actually saleable, believe it or not. Jill could hang that up in the kitchen. A Stradivarius. Uh -huh. I'm only joking. You can often get real treasures in these boxes. I mean, I've been in this auction several times, and I remember once I came in, there was a box of, of crockery, and I rummaged through it at the bottom was just what one of my customers wanted. Uh, some really nice Norfolk Dalton plates, worth about 25, 30 pounds a piece. I think there was six in there. And I got the box for eight pounds. If that's the case, then you, you wouldn't then go, look, I found a Dalton plate. You'd have to keep it quiet. Very quiet, yeah. Because you buy the contents of the box, you buy the whole box. You yeah, hide the them, box. you yeah. hide them at the bottom of the box again. Uh -huh. and hide them under the table again and hope no one else sees them. It's unusual furniture, isn't there, Morris? Look at this. Yeah, that's a nice wash down here, actually. You put your jug on there, would you? Yeah, jug and uh, basin. That's all this stuff, it might have been a skip, might it? Well, probably that's the best place for that. But some of it, you this. could... Well, that's right. With a bit of care, you could do something with that, couldn't you? Of course, you've got Victorian pine chest of drawers. Lovely. It's good hunting ground, actually, for anyone who collects or any dealers who are, who are looking for sort of bottom of the range, middle of the range antiques. But they have to be prepared to do some work on it. One of the great things about buying antiques is that you can be as adventurous or as safe as you like. You can always find places locally to add wonderful items full of history to your home or you can travel the country into Europe, America or beyond, spending as much as you can afford. We knew that John and Jill enjoyed antiques relating to the sea as they live near the coast. So on a trip to Maine, New England, we visited one of the antique quarters and we found out why it's such a special place. All of New England has a uh, rich history and uh, lots of antique shops. You'd be hard pressed to find a place to go antiquing in such a spectacular setting. Maine has a very rich seafaring history, particularly in the 1800s. Ships from Maine traveled all over the world. And these sea captains were like the CEOs of today's companies. They traveled all over the world and wherever they went, um, they had some disposable income and they would bring things home. How old is this It's 18th century, um, probably late 1700s, um, and it was used as a table and a chair. Um, and at one time, they didn't have much space in a small room like this, so uh, they would use it as your dining room table and then they would turn it and sit at it. You'll have to show me how to do it. Yes, and it's called either a hutch table, <laughs> see, and, um, and then they would sit at, at the table and sometimes if it was by the fireplace you would turn it 
so that it would protect you and keep you warmer. And this would protect you against the cold. I can imagine this this person who made this just sitting there on his own in his house. Do you ever do that? Do you ever, do you ever speculate about who might have done Yes, this? it's fun to do that. Um, and perhaps this man could have been a farmer, a blacksmith. He, he could have been a seaman. And when he came home from the sea, this is where he would sit. Um, and then uh, the fire in the evening, when they're through eating and the fire is going, they would turn the table up and sit on it. And perhaps he sat on it and the wife did the little dishes by hand. <laughs> What's very interesting as well is that the, the Europeans' image of America is of newness and modernity, and yet people will, people will buy these, these pieces and put them in the house and try and, try, and create, try and recreate an authentic old setting? I think the computer world has caused people more and more to realize how important it is to have that homespun look mm. of, of home. Um, and um, I think people come to Maine because from all over the country and the world because it, it is so, uh, so much of a feeling of casual atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the museum in town, which is more formal, mm -hmm. but on the whole, a house like this is, seems to be more uh, furniture that would be casual and mm. easy to live with and, and not formal in a small room like this. But not only casual, but, but somehow full of atmosphere and tells a story. Mm -hmm. My dad was a sailor and he would have loved this. This is a proper sailor's chest, isn't it, with these Beckett's. fantastic handles. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. what they're called, these? Beckett's. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. How old is this then? This would probably be from the mid 1800s, approximately. Sometimes as early as the early 1800s, um, and even to the late 1800s. It's a whole mm. range. And how did they survive so long without? I mean, presumably a lot of them get chopped up for firewood. Some, some don't <laughs> exist, do they? Well, perhaps they were stuck in attics, or or they were just put in a workshop. Many times things are found in workshops. Mm. Um, beautiful servers come out of workshops where they or cupboards and apothecaries, mm. and uh, this could have been the case. Um, uh, this one is unusual, mainly because of oh, yeah. this painting on the inside, and I've sold those to clients over the years, and in ten years now I have not found one with the decorated ship painting on the lid, or they separated them and burnt part of it. <laughs> yeah, that is fabulous. Because you can imagine, I don't know, you guess that the sailor who had this for his things would have painted that. Yes. Maybe that's a boat that he was on. Yes, yes. It's, it's at sea and it's a rough sea. What I, I love art that isn't by artists. I think that's really nice to have the history of something. Uh, a while ago I got a sextant which has initials on and belongs to obviously a seafaring family and uh, there's many that a time I take it out and try and work out how people would have used it and it sort of conjures up mental images of who actually owned it what voyages they went on using it um, there's all sorts of inspiration comes from just picking up and handling the the piece of the tools that that person would have used and that's one of the beauties of antiques they they have a history they belong to someone someone actually used it somebody um, it was part of someone's life and it might have been a dramatic life it might just have been an ordinary life like like ours so what kind of age is this 1840 1820 at the earliest, 1840 at the latest. I love the, the functionalness of it. Yeah. It's, not, it's not decorated exactly. in any way. It's just a... The simplicity of it. Yeah. It's, um, it's what I love as well, the simplicity and the um, proportions. It's a piece of sculpture, really. It is. Yeah. What kind of house would this go into now, then? Who would buy this? Well, that's always a good question. Um, and I never know. Um, I could see it in two totally opposite um, settings. I could see it in a very contemporary, very mm. contemporary home with lots of glass, sort of California um, home on the water. Um, and it would be, it would be the, the centerpiece uh, of the room, no question about it. I found this book mm. of flowers and... Um, Isn't that beautiful? I opened it and then my heart did skip a beat, yes. and the whole life flashed in because this was 
from England. This is three miles from where I live. Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, I love it. I just picked it up when I was in England less than a month ago. Well, Hickleton Hall is a, no a stately home, maybe three miles from where I live. Oh Lord my Halifax God. used to be in charge of Hickleton Hall, and Wood no is my mother's maiden name. Oh my God! And she lives maybe. She lives maybe miles. Now I have shivers. And that is an amazing thing. And then and Hickleton Isn't Hall. Isn't that amazing? We used to drive every Sunday. We would drive to Hickleton and sit How? in front of the hall and have an ice cream. And that's the thing. To find that is well, amazing. Well, I think that's the thing about this: is it is history. It's yeah. all history, and um, we all have deep, deep histories. Mm -hmm. And to find something like you say that is close to home or. Um, and to find it, God. 4, thousand miles from home. Isn't that amazing? It is. It amazing. is. And this is another piece that you're just attracted to by its simplicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, this is what, a blanket chest? Yeah. Yes, a blanket chest, 18th century. Um, you can, its age, it tells its age by the, um, the width. It's very, very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and we say in America, it sits close to the wall. So it's, it's, it's very thin and it, uh, it doesn't take up much room. Um, once again, it's, it, it's color. Um, it's dry, wonderful surface that no one has um, uh, restored, no one has touched. Um, this has great appeal in America mm. to the people that love American furniture, um, antique furniture. I think because our heritage is so s short, probably yeah. as well. The person that built this was not necessarily a, a good craftsman, and it probably was um, not terribly expensive. We tend to think in England that antiques have to be sort of smart and glossy, and they can actually be quite simplistic. You don't, it doesn't have to be mahogany furniture, it doesn't have to be oak furniture. It can be something very traditional, something very rustic. And there's an awful lot of workmanship goes into these very simple things that go, will last for generations. And it's one of those things that people actually want in their houses now. So it doesn't have to be grand to be an antique. Atmosphere. I mean, you see people sitting down at lunchtime and just throwing cloths over the most old tables, and they're not bothered, they sit and have their lunch. Other tips bring lots of water. If you're with a friend and you lose them in a market like this, it's worth having a phone to make a rendezvous and take some notes of what you found. I've already lost a gorgeous children's silver christening cup because I was navigating by a stuffed lion at the end of this row. Somebody bought it. I have nothing to navigate by now. Only in France. Could you find something like this? In slang, it's called love popotin. And Guy here Pupotin. will show you if you haven't already got it. It's love popotin. Okay, yes, it's, it's for washing a certain area of your anatomy. We're not going to go further into this. The, the polite word in France is uh, a bain de siège. Bain de siège, but I, I think this love popotin is lovely. Uh, it comes, can we turn it, Guy, with a little, little tap here? So I presume you fill it with, with water, and then when you've finished, out it comes. And you were telling me it's all, all made in lots of little pieces and welded together and probably... Master, masterpiece. Masterpiece from, from, from the 1800s. Absolutely amazing. So you would, you would sit in this. Um, Peut-être pour des femmes, puisque c'est petit, probably oui, a ladies piece. Oui. Pour, pour hommes aussi? Ben, euh, je pense plutôt pour les femmes. If you were a very small man, you might get in, really for women. And funny enough, I've just been told, I think this is amazing, just as a talking piece, it's a woman from Australia who's come to Avignon and has bought it today. So this piece, a love popotin, washed the leather regions, and it's going all the way back, down under. Get it? Very appropriate. This little fella is gorgeous, but he's not going to help me in my hunt for finding something for 50 quid. He is an amazing 900 pounds, but it's really not surprising. He's a fairground horse, and I'm told he's from the end of the late 1800s. He's got all his original bits, the stirrups. He would have been a fixed horse, not one of the ones that went up and down. And he's even got the old original tail. I'm still going to find something. Morris, I will find my bargain for 50 pounds yet. Peignet pour le mariage avec la date du mariage. Perfect. Well, as you can see, they are lovely big wardrobes that were given on the occasion of marriage. This one is 1842. Et puis tu me fais voir celui-là. This one is even more ancient because if you look, 
it's got a lovely, lovely old lock on that. And on this wardrobe, you'll also see, uh, she was explaining to me earlier, this one is hand painted, all the flowers. Um, but you can have them actually even earlier that are stenciled, which surprised me because I thought the hand painted ones would be older and more expensive. But this lovely, um, well, it was a grain cabinet that's just beside me with uh, a crocodile on top. What else? It's a French market. They've got absolutely everything. This is even older and it was stenciled. And I think it's gorgeous. I haven't got room to take it home, but I think it's gorgeous. If you don't speak French, just have a go because if you do speak something, you can get out so much more. Um, Madame, il y avait des artistes spéciales qui faisaient ces peintures. Voilà. I'm just asking, Madame, if there were certain artists that, that did this lovely design. Ils répétaient le même motif de village en village. Ils avaient trois ou quatre modèles qui répétaient. C'était des peintres très naïfs. Okay, so it's, it's, as you see, it's naive art, and each each artist would really have its own signature, whether it was a flower or a bird. And imagine getting something like this on your wedding and then passing it down to your daughter and she in turn to hers. A fantastic family heirloom. When you think French antiques, you think style, you think Louis XIV and all the rest of it. You do not normally think gnomes. But these are no ordinary gnomes. They are stone statues and they are Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, no less. And they're a complete set, which is very, very rare. So we have Doc, we have Grumpy, we have Happy, we have the whole set. And there is a chap here. It reminds me of somebody, maybe it's Morris who hasn't yet spent his £50. He'd have to spend £300 to get this lot. Morris, you can't have them. Now, I've spent my £50. I haven't actually bought this, but I've called on Morris because I love it. And I'm thinking of spending some more money, Morris. Now, you're our painting expert. What do you think of it? Is this a good buy? Let me have a look. You hold that, that one. one. They're a pair, but I like this one best. Yeah, well, it's slightly impressionist. Mm -hmm. Some quite strong brush strokes on it. And I like the sunrise, sunset, and the reflection on the water. The beauty of discovering so much about the history of places and the lives of people through the antiques we buy today is all adding a great sense of well-being and warmth to John and Jill's home.